good afternoon, everybody, or I probably should say ladies, and uh, in a more smaller form, gentlemen. So we are only four of us here, four men, and the majority is women. This is always wonderful to see. Um, yeah, welcome. My name is Klaus Mielich. I am the director of the Montgomery Fellows Program here at Dartmouth College. And um, yeah, the Montgomery Fellows Program, the mission of the Montgomery Fellows Program is and has been for 40 years already to bring very distinguished people to Dartmouth and to give our students and faculty and the Dartmouth community the opportunity to meet luminaries, I would say, from all walks of life, not only from uh, scholarship or not only from um, uh, the sciences and the humanities, but also from the arts. We had writers, we had uh, journalists, we had politicians, we had uh, musicians, we had performers. One of them is here today. Uh, so we do not only cover the academic uh, aspect of a college, but also in the wider sense, um, everything uh, with the arts, with writing, with politics, with activists. So um, if you look at the list and if you look at our homepage, uh, the Montgomery website, you will see uh, who has been here from um, Bishop Tutu to uh, Achebe to uh, Tony Morrison to Philip Roth to Kurt Vonnegut to Yo-Yo Ma and I could go on with a very long list of really uh, distinguished people who do not only come for a day to give a talk and leave again. The mission of the Montgomery Fellows Program is to attract our guests to stay a little bit longer and to mingle, so to speak, and to engage really with the Dartmouth community. I want to keep myself very short. I just wanted to say that we have here today a wonderful guest, Rodessa Jones. She is a very famous performer, and I may say uh, that the Jones family made quite an impact, and I think it is the only family over the 40 years uh, not in terms of all the presidential dynasties that we know in this country, uh, but this is the Jones dynasty that had a mark, that had a mark on uh, the Montgomery Fellows Program because her brother, Billy T. Jones, had been already a Montgomery Fellow a couple of years ago, I think, if I remember correctly, in 2010. I want to keep this very short. Uh, I want to thank some people, particularly the nominators, uh, Petty Hernandez and also Ivy Schweitzer, who teach a legendary course that has been going on for quite some years on campus. And this is a course on um, um, uh, stories, telling stories. And within this course, they also have a topic on incarcerated women. And as uh, some of you might know, Rodessa Jones worked uh, tremendously um, uh, on a project with incarcerated women and uh, so this was the occasion to uh, nominate Rodessa Jones um, which we would not limit only to this one particular aspect. Uh, in fact, she is coming back in the fall to be a Montgomery Fellow for the entire term and there will be much more events going on then. Um, this week she has come here for a very particular reason because for Ivy Schweitzer's and Patty Hernandez's seminar and we organized a little program around it. So I would also like to thank uh, the GRID, the Gender for Research Institute at Dartmouth for supporting and organizing and framing this wonderful event today. And uh, Ivy Schweitzer will um, say some words about the GRID and then probably also introduce an old friend of Rodessa Jones who happens to live here right in Norwich and which gave us the opportunity to invite her to introduce uh, Rodessa Jones and I guess that Marjorie Cantor will probably also say some words how these two women met. So uh, I don't know, but uh, we will see. So thank you very much all for coming and Ivy, thank you very much. Hi, can everybody hear me? Good? Good. Well, thank you, Klaus, um, and thank you to the Montgomery Fellowship Program for the generous sponsorship, Ellen Henderson, who is the 
the organizer and the backbone of Montgomery. Thank you so much, Ellen. We really appreciate everything you do. So I'm here to talk a little bit about the GRID seminar, Gender in Research Institute at Dartmouth. Here's our poster for this spring. Um, the theme is Feminist Reflections on Transgression, Humility, and Chaos, and I am pleased and honored and privileged to be co-directing it with my longtime collaborator, Patty Hernandez, who's sitting here in the front. Um, I also want to make a big shout out to and thank you to Annabelle Martin, uh, who is the director of GRID. Where are you? Annabelle, right there. Thank you so much for all your support and encouragement. And of course, Nancy O'Brien, without which, without whom nothing in GRID would ever get done. So Nancy, you really keep us right on track. Um, so what we have um, in, we have a seminar going on, and many of you, some of you here are in the seminar, um, students, faculty, and staff, in which we are, what are we doing? We're experiencing transgression, humility, and chaos in our <laughs> class, I'd say. <laughs> uh, radical, I'm sorry, radical unlearning. Yes, that is what we're experiencing, radical unlearning. And there'll be a quiz at the end to try to figure out what that is, right? Um, but a grid, the, the GRID in Institute always has um, public events in which we invite people from the outside to come and to speak to us about their expertise. Rodessa is the fourth in our series, and we're so pleased to have her. I'll say a little bit about her in a minute. But the, la the next and last um, event is on Wednesday, May 24th from 4.30 to 6 p.m. It will be a screening of the film uh, uh, It's Criminal, A Tale of Incarceration and the Ivy League, uh, which is a film about the class that Patty and I teach. Um, it's the 2010 iteration of that class. We raised money and it, we had it filmed and it is now a full-length film. We premiered it at the uh, LA Women's Film Festival a couple of weeks ago, and it was so much fun, very successful. And we will have a panel also of the director, several student alums who, were, who have graduated from Dartmouth who were in the class, and actually two women who were in the facility at the time who are now on the outside and live in the Upper Valley, and they will be there with Patty and I, and it'll be wonderful. So that's May 24th at and 41 Haldeman. So now, um, I'm going, I'm going to um, say a little bit about Rodessa, and then I will introduce Marjorie Cantor, who's an old friend of hers, and she will give a more personal introduction. Rodessa Jones is an actress, teacher, director, and writer. Patty and I first got to know her. Um, I, we were looking for people working with incarcerated women and working in the kind of, doing the kind of theater that we, that was political, that was spiritual, that was activist. Um, we came upon a book by Rena Fraden called Imagining Medea. Uh, it's a book we assigned, started assigning in our courses and we decided we have to get to know this woman, we have to meet her, invite her to campus. And that's really kind of how it happened. And if people want to know a little bit more, go check that book out, Imagining Medea by Rena Fraden, wonderful book. Um, she is the co-artistic director of the acclaimed San Francisco performance company Cultural Odyssey and founder and director of the award-winning Media Project Theater for Incarcerated Women and the HIV Circle, which is a performance workshop designed to achieve personal and social transformation with incarcerated women and women, women living with HIV. Uh, this, this, this group has been going on, this workshop has been going on for many years, and it's won many awards. In 2015, uh, Rodessa, as the, as the co-director, was awarded a Theater Practitioner Award by Theater Communications Group, which recognizes, quote, a living individual whose work in the American theater has evidenced exemplary achievement over time and who has contributed significantly to the development of the larger field. Her directorial projects include Blessing the Boats, the remix, Sekou Sundiata's solo theater work at the Public Theater in New York City, the African American Shakespeare Company's production of Ex Tigany, uh, the new play Lost in Language by Entezaki Shange, Eve Ensler's Any One of Us for the V-Day Until the Violence Stops Festival, 
performed at Lincoln Center's Alice Tully Hall and Will Powers' The Gathering. Rodessa and Marjorie Cantor met in the 1970s as part of a collective called the People's Restaurant and Cultural Center in San Francisco, which was part of the food system. Rodessa was dancing in a company called Tumbleweed, which did contact improvisation. They have remained friends ever since. Marjorie is a book and publication designer and letterpress printer based in Norwich, Vermont. So I'm going to now wel welcome Marjorie to the stage, and she will give a short introduction, and then we will have Rodessa. Thank you. I've known Rodessa for nearly uh, 40 years, which is why I've been asked to introduce her. If you look Rodessa Jones up online, there are wonderful accolades about her, about her work, and so many awards. The acclaim is mind-boggling. But right now, I will describe what I have seen and experienced during all these years. Rodessa is an alchemist, a magician, a woman who knows, as the Igbo saying goes, all stories are true. And she also knows that all these stories need to be told and that they can be told in a multitude of ways. They can be told in music or in dance or in spoken word or any combination. She also knows that if and when we hear each other's stories, we are transformed and transformed for the better. Because when we hear our stories, when we hear each other's stories, our hearts and minds change. We can be open. We can become fully human. Please welcome Rodessa. Wow, Charlie, I'm pregnant, living on Ninth Street, above the dirty bookstore on Euclid Avenue. Stop taking dope, I stop drinking whiskey. My old man, oh, he plays the trombone. And he works out at the track. Says that he loves me, even though it's not his baby. Said he's going to raise him up like he would his own son. Gave me this here ring that's been worn by his mother. He takes me out dancing every Saturday night. Mm -hmm. Jolly, I think about you every time I pass the filling station. Cause of all the grease you used to wear in your hair. And I still got that record. Little Anthony and the Imperials. Somebody stole my record player. How do you like that? Jolly, I almost went crazy when Mario got busted. And I moved back to Omaha to live with my folks. Cause everyone, everyone, everyone I used to know is either dead or in prison. Came back to Dartmouth. This time I think I want to stay. Charlie, mm -hmm. I think about you. Each time I pass the filling station, cause of all the grease you used to wear in your hair. And I still got that record. Little Anthony and the Imperials. Uh, somebody stole my record player. How do you like that? For God's sake, Charlie, if you want to know the truth of it, 
I don't have me no husband. He don't play no trombone. And I need, I need, I need to borrow money, Charlie Hay, to pay, to pay this here lawyer. I'll be eligible for parole come Valentine's Day. It's Tom Waits. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I uh, gathering stories at the edge of the world. When I was thinking about doing this talk, and then I was in class, and Patty Hernandez and and uh, you have to you have to forgive me. I'm old. I'm I'm cute, but I'm old. Okay, so I don't remember everything. But uh, I was so moved with the young people talking and discussing the projects that they're going to be doing here as a part of the school and this correctional center that I thought that I wanted to just sort of jump into the idea of what is it to be alive? I used to work a lot with juvenile delinquents when I first started out. And uh, I would go to these community centers where they would bring in these boys from, largely boys of course, and uh, they would be so mad and so petulant and they'd be like, they would just be ready for, ready for the world and all they knew was that they didn't want nobody to disrespect them. And I would say, do you want to live or do you want to die? And they didn't know. It puzzled them. And as I've traveled around the world, one of my questions for young people in particular, but for definitely people in lockdown is, what does it mean to be alive? We take it for granted, you know. We have our jobs, we have our children, we have our vacations, we have our retirement. We ha and if we're lucky, we have that love life that has lasted at least 50 years. And, you know, we go on into time feeling loved and wanted and, and accomplished to a certain degree. But there's a lot of us that have no idea about what it is to be alive. And then when I met women, I was sent into the jails in San Francisco, oh my God, uh, 30, 40 years ago, to teach aerobics to incarcerated women. God bless California, you know. They wanted to do something. You know, they wanted to do something. And here was um, Jane Fonda. Here was all of these, uh, aerobics was big. And they thought, oh, this Jones woman, she's a dancer. We'll have her come in and knock. Uh, I'd been a CETA artist, see? And they wanted me to come in and teach aerobics. And I'm like, first of all, I'm not an aerobics teacher. I move and Tumbleweed, the company that I danced with, we were aerialists, we were contact improvisation people. We, we were strong, we were macho, we were all that stuff. We were like, we would roll up in a town, baby, and eat the whole town. We were just so powerful. So of course, I, I get the call. I go into the jails. And I'm amazed at all the women that look like me, brown women, black women in lockdown. And nobody told me that there were this many women in lockdown. Now, I, I come from a large family. I have, I have eight brothers. Well, actually, four of them have passed on. But I'm an African-American woman that uh, knows something about incarceration because I have eight brothers. I, have, I had a brother who was at Attica when Attica fell. So I know something about incarceration with men, but I had no idea that there were so many women in jail. And it was, it was enticing, it was provocative. I thought, okay, well, what can I do here? What can, how, can, how can I change their lives? You know, and you go in, you know, and this aerobics at one time was like the, the shit, right? It's like, okay, everybody! All right, everybody, and one, and two, and three, and a sack, and one, and two, come on, this is your life, this is not a rehearsal, one, and two, and three, and these women are like, <laughs> then they start talking about me to each other, 
And I'm telling them about myself. I'm talking, and I, I, my daughter just got married. I was about 43, 44. And uh, all, they, all, they, all they registered with them was that I was an old bitch. Right? I'd say, what was this old bitch saying? And I'm like, hold up, y'all. Why do I have to be an old bitch? You know, it's like, and then they're like, oh, she's talking to us. And I'm like, yeah, I see you. I see you. And we're going to have a conversation. But I realized that so much was lost because nobody told them. And we had a young woman, Bianca Robinson. Bianca Robinson, I met my second year at the county jail. And B Bianca Robinson was in jail for prostitution. And, and she had left her six-year-old daughter with her man in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. And her man gets into an altercation with the boys in the street and guns are drawn, and this six-year-old girl is blown away who's standing in the back seat of a car simply drinking milk out of a bottle. And in jail, she howled. It was like she, would be, she was, in, they put her in lockdown. And she says, well, Miss Jones, I gotta go home. I, I said, honey, you're in jail. They don't have to let you go home. And I said to the other women, Notice this. This is one of the reasons you want to keep your butt out of jail. This woman's baby has died, and she can't go home and officiate. And they lock her down because they're afraid that she'd try to run away or she would hurt herself. And together, the group, we talked about what is it that keeps some of us in, in trouble, and what is it that keeps the rest of us out and free and about. So I want to do this piece that we wrote, and I need for you to help me. So I'm going to say, nobody told her, and you're going to say, nobody. Let's practice. Nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her. Nobody. Good. Now she can't believe it when it's said. Born behind the eight ball, life is a house of cards. Everything's fine as long as there's no wind. Nobody told her nobody. that it would all be blown away. Her house, her money, her children, her love, her life. Nobody told her nobody. that the one waiting on the street corner, in the alleyway, in that room, that hotel, is the one who loses it all. Nobody told her nobody. that nothing much is expected of her. Therefore, she doesn't have to hope for much. Nobody told her. Nobody, nobody told her that she's getting on that train, that she's getting in that car, that she's caught in the traffic, and where is this destination? Where's the host role? Uh, is there a host role in Dartmouth? Could be, huh? could be. Uh, what's the host role in Boston? Host role where the prostitutes hang out. Come on, y'all. Where is it? What's the street? Boston is the biggest city, right? You can talk to me, come on. <laughs> I want to go see the girls, come on. <laughs> but is there a street? <laughs> oh, we've got a winner here tonight. Okay, okay, right. Uh, nobody told her that she's getting in the car. She's getting in that tr on that train, and she's caught in the traffic, and what is this destination? West Highway, 57th Street, Ellison Taylor, Subic Bay, Roseland Road, and Johannesburg? Nobody told her <laughs> that while doing time for prostitution, trying to get enough money to feed her baby, nobody told her that her baby's brains would be splattered on the back seat of a car in the Tenderloin. Nobody told her. Nobody, Nobody told her. Nobody, Nobody told her. Nobody. So how could she know? Nobody told her. Nobody. Thank you. I love being an artist, you know. I mean, when I, the thing that, when I went into the jails, the thing that made most sense to me was the creativity, the drama, 
you know, of working and with women, women, women anyway. I love women, and we're very dramatic, are we not? You know, are we, are we, our bodies are made for drama. When you're menopausal, you're a heater, okay? And, when, and before you start, and when you start your menses, your breast, everything is growing, and you're pulsating, and you're and you cry a lot, or you laugh a lot, and it's like I love the idea of being female, you know. And uh, this is one of the things I brought into the jails, and I talk to women about a lot because uh, it's so easy to feel like you you've failed, you failed the system that has nothing to do with you, you know, that you're you're not a good girl, or you got caught, you know. When I first started working in the jails, I met a young woman named Debbie Turner. And Debbie Turner was going to, African American girl. She decided she just didn't like me because I was uppity and all that. This woman knew nothing about me other than that I spoke fairly well and I was there working in the jails. And she decided that she was going to disrespect me. She wasn't going to pay attention. So she is dribbling a ball. Uh, in the gym, and I'm trying to talk to my crew, get everybody together because we're going to do exercises and blah wee blah wee. This woman is, you know, she's shooting. She's shooting. Just boom, 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 boom. Bam, she's shooting. And the women are saying, Deborah, show Miss Jones some respect. Why don't you stop? Blah, 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 blah. And this is my rites of passage for anybody who thinks you're going to do this for the rest of your life. And we need you. But you're going to have, a, somebody's going to try you, as they say in Negroville. Somebody's going to try you, okay? So I'm looking at this girl, and she's, she was a good basketball player, an incredible athlete, you know, just some beautiful moves. And my goblin is saying, go for it, Ro. Just go for it. Knock her down or something. My angel is like, no, she will kill us. Just let her play. Maybe you all just go home. Start crying and go home. But Rodessa said, oh, hell no. This is my class. You are not going to do this in my class. So I, I run up and I grab the ball. And I'm scared to death, <laughs> you know, but I'm holding the ball. And she's like, well, you, you know, you're some jive-ass black girl. You've been to a college. You know, you, you, you think that you, I'm from the streets. You don't know nothing. And I said, really? And all the women are waiting because they're watching, you see. I said, you know what? I've probably done everything you've ever done. And I didn't get caught. I said, and secondly, they pay me to be here. And I'm going home at 11 o'clock. Now, who's smarter? <laughs> and the women were on their feet. They were high-fiving. And my little goblin and my little devil was like, oh, boy, did we miss a bullet. <laughs> and the deputies saw that I knew something about how to handle myself. And they were up, a, up in a booth like that, and they were like, Jones, is it cool? I said, we got this. And I said to Deborah, we got this, right? And she said, oh, well, yeah. And she became a very, very helpful entity to me. And Deborah went on to come down with HIV, and she's, uh, she's still in the streets, but she, she went through a lot, and she was a serious uh, little hood rat and a you know, fabulous lesbian woman who got caught up in uh, prostitution, and so she caught HIV and this kind of stuff, but she's still a friend of mine. I still see her in the streets when I'm moving through San Francisco. But uh, that was my rites of passage, and uh, I knew at that moment that the water is rising, heavy air, Tears are filling the hole, the weight, the heat, the rocking. The water is boiling, heavy air, greasy rooms, uh, slipping in blood, soiled clothes, and the cold, cold stones. The water is ringing, heavy air, the chains, metallic taste in her mouth, screaming, straining, glistening in vomit. I am ashamed. Where is this place? Bones are scattered everywhere. The water is rising, rattles the windows, electrodes explode in wounds, heavy air running, running with feet on fire, tongues are torn, somebody's daughter is crying. I have come to claim the body of my son. Whole worlds die before our eyes and it is unlawful to cry. We are left, locked 
and twisted, wrapped in irons, fried in fire, speechless, no eyes. Oh, we forget our father's names in the silence, the silence, the silence and the shame. The water is boiling, heavy air. Thank you. I'm going to go, yeah, I, I love it. You can give it up for me. I love that, okay? Uh, but what, is it, what does it mean to be alive? I'm going to uh, go into another section here. Oh, I have so much I'd like to share with you, so we're going to just roll right along. I met a young woman by the name of Shanique. E. Vinsler asked me to go into the jails in San Francisco and examine domestic violence and the results. And she, uh, because she, she, like, you know, she knew that I was an artist doing this. So she said, I want you to go in. I want you to create a situation where women will share their stories with you about um, where they've been and what they're doing. Because Eve later di did this piece at Lincoln Center called Any One of Us. And, you know, you got to give it up because she's seriously a goddess and a uh, very, very powerful woman. But there was one young woman who wouldn't play the game. She sat in the back of the room like a fist. And she watched me as I got women to write. And then she came up and she handed me her poem. Here, she says. And she heads out. And I said, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. She says, you, you ain't going to like it. It ain't no good. And she's going, I said, wait, wait, wait. I said, read it to me. You cannot live my life because you haven't been stabbed in the arms three times with a knife. You cannot say you just like me because you didn't test positive HIV. You cannot say you feel my pain. You have never held up in the rain. You cannot do what I did because I did four years in the pen. You cannot live my dream because you ain't been beat down by your own damn mama. So you cannot have my glory because mine has been one hell of a story. You cannot say I'm going to live long. Don't you really think, don't you, do you really think that I'm that damn strong? You cannot live my life. And she turned and walked away. And she came back the next night and uh, asked me, did I like her writing? <laughs> and I said, yes, I like your writing very much. And uh, she said, uh, you didn't say that. I said, well, you kind of hit me with it and you left. And, uh, but Shanique, Shanique is another girl that's uh, very sick with HIV. And uh, I want to just show you. And so HIV called to me. I want to jump forward now and... Um, Diane, I'm going to do what you told me to do. <laughs> Diane's my... Okay, here we go. I awake now. I pray to God my soul to do. The more volume we can. I kept it a secret. I didn't want to tell nobody. For most of her life, Cassandra Steptoe lived a fine line between life and death. I started using drugs when I was 11 years old growing up. And um, I got into that street life. You know, I got into prostitution. Um, I started going to uh, California Youth Authority prison. And that was my life up until in my 40s. It was during one of her prison terms that Cassandra got tested for HIV. It was 1987, and she was 31 years old. Me and a couple of women that I knew, and we all went up there to get tested. And they came back and said they was negative, and it was my turn. And I went up, and they told me I had it, and I started crying. I started crying because I thought it was a, a death sentence. For almost 15 years, Cassandra kept it to herself until she met Dr. Machtinger, who began to care for her. The biggest misconception about AIDS in the minority women community is that it's exceptional, that, that it's something unusual, that a black woman with HIV is a rarity when it's, when it's not at all. 
Dr. Moktinga is the director of the University of California, San Francisco's Positive Health Clinic, which was designed specifically for the needs of women with HIV. I went into medicine to be an HIV doctor. I, when I got to New York City in 1985 as a young gay kid, AIDS was exploding. In the early 80s, mysterious fatal diseases struck the gay community. They were later identified as AIDS. By the time Cassandra was diagnosed, the total number of HIV-related deaths in the U.S. had reached 20,000. I wanted to kill myself with drugs because I thought that I was going to die being HIV positive because that's all I heard back in the 80s, everybody's dying. Cassandra's turning point came seven years ago when a drug dealer threatened her life. Either I was going to get killed or I needed to do something. Not only did she need to make a change for herself, but also for her family, who she had neglected while hooked on drugs. Living out in those streets, I lost a sister out there in those streets. I got raped out there in those streets. I got beaten up out there. And it's all behind, you know, trying to get my next eye. When Cassandra told her family about her diagnosis, she faced rejection that sent her back to the streets. My sister didn't even want me around her, didn't want me in the house, didn't want me around the kids, you know, and um, I start using it again. Dr. Machtinger says black women with HIV have difficulty revealing their status, putting them and their community at additional risk. If they can't come out to their families, if they can't come out to their child, if they can't be out at work, it's very hard for them to take medicines as religiously as they need to. It's very hard to go to the doctor. Um, it's very hard to protect their partners. Today, HIV is one of the top killers of black women between the ages of 25 and 44. According to the Center for Disease Control, by the end of 2006, black women made up 15% of all existing cases and 15% of all new diagnoses, despite being only 7% of the population. Dr. Martinger wanted his patients to be more open about their lives and found help for them outside the medical community. The biggest issue confronted in this group is how to get them to go there to talk about being HIV positive. Reach up! Drop! Actress and director Rodessa Jones is the founder of the Medea Project. Nice Cassandra. For almost 20 years, she has offered theater workshops for incarcerated women. This year, she began helping Dr. Machtinger's patients. The clinic is looking for any way to uh, enhance their lives, to, to deepen their understanding of what it is to, to work to be healthy and strong and sane. We've all got a painful story to tell. Rodessa is focusing on shame and stigma and silence in a way that I, as a doctor, can't, and the medical community tends not to be able to, or public health campaigns have trouble doing. But don't forget the hands, because yeah. too much of this. Okay. Rodessa teaches the women to turn their personal experiences into theatrical performances that will help ease their pain. Cassandra wants to go even further. Not only does it help me spiritually inside, but I might be able to touch one person in that audience. Because there's a lot of young women that are being tested and don't want a treatment or are in denial or shame. Just because he's fine don't mean that he's not HIV. Cassandra's goal is to complete her education. She will earn an associate's degree from San Francisco City College next year. She wants to become an HIV counselor. As for her personal life, things are changing too. Her family is back in her life, and a year ago she met a man who accepts her HIV positive status. I used to uh, think, God, I'm never going to have anybody, you know. Nobody going to want me because I'm HIV positive, but, you know, I, I was wrong, you know. I'm getting married next, next year. Dr. Machtinger says Cassandra was lucky to have survived for so long without treatment, 
And with advances in medicine, people with HIV have the chance to live long, healthy lives. I admire the courage and strength of someone like Cassandra, who can not only survive with HIV, but thrive. I felt like the cards that was dealt to me was a lesson. It was an experience to get me where I'm at today, because I could be somewhere else being really miserable. And today, I live a very happy, spiritual life. I don't take life for granted. It's very special to me. in class, but I think you had gone already. Um, we were just coming up with our paper topics. Oh, your memory from the class. Yeah. Hi, memory. I love Hi, that name. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know how you know it's working. How do, how do I know it's working? Well, Cassandra Septo is now a full assistant of mine. Dr. Ma Edward Mocktinger is my art partner. At this, at, uh, so thus, UC Medical Center is my art partner in San Francisco. I have more women that stay with the group than leave the group. There are people that die, but what's working? I mean, all I can do is do the work. You know what I'm saying? And it falls where it, falls where it will. And here I am talking to you here as a fellow at Dartmouth. It's working. You know, it's like all of these things, and I don't, I don't plan this stuff, but that's the most you can do is go with a full heart, with great intention, and share what you know, and put yourself in it. You know, it's not like, I'm gonna help these people, because I, it's helped me immensely. I am so grateful that I am who I am, that I've lived a life I've lived, because, uh, you know, I was a mother before I was a woman, and if it had not been for art, and your bright eyes and your greedy smiles, I'd be no more than a memory or a bitch with a very bad attitude. Art saved my life and I took it into the jails. I shared that with women. I wanted to work with art. I didn't, tr I was a drama, ther drama therapy is a little bit a part of acting and that kind of thing, but I really wanted to share what I knew with women. So to, I hope that answers your question, but I never so much concerned is, is it working? Cause it is, I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I, uh, I have a lot of uh, godchildren, you know. I haven't had one woman in my group that was HIV positive, and still, with Dr. Mark Thing's help and my help, she's had a, a fully, her baby now is uh, nearly three years old, and he's healthy, you know. So, and we, we, the Medea Project with me, we took her through the whole thing. And she was able to go back to Austria and tell her family that she, she was HIV positive, and she was pregnant. And, and she trusted us that, that that was happening. But good question. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Well, I have uh, been funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. Because of the show, the work, the, the work, you know, of the work that is way out there before me. Uh, in San Francisco, we have the, the, um, the San Francisco Hotel Tax Fund in the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, Dr. Mocking is uh, the medical community. I am, I am like, uh, written into some of their, their, uh, their studies. Like they did a study on expensive therapy. And uh, the day I probably was the study, was the center of that study. So we, we uh, funded that way. Um, the, um, I, I was working in Africa, and in Africa, the African lottery was very generous with me. The Ford Foundation was generous with me. So, so the funding happens. And uh, it's, it's a little scary right now because there isn't as much funding. And we, as we know, uh, our beloved leader, uh, that's all I would say, uh, is not interested in any of this. Oh, uh, you know, oh, uh, Agent Orange, he's that interesting. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, 
Rodessa, can you talk about the difference between working with women, incarcerated women, and women with HIV? Well, the, uh, on one level, the profile is the same. You know, a lot of the women in my group who are HIV positive, they, uh, they were found out in prison. They found out so in prison. Uh, with women that are HIV positive, uh, it's it, like last night, uh, I'm working with Peter Brook in, uh, in San Francisco. He's at, with ACT. And we were given tickets for opening night. Three of my women, they're, they're, they're on new meds. They couldn't get up to go. You know, so it's like their health. You know, it's their health. And, um, and then like uh, Cassandra, she had been out there since she was 11 years old. She was a drug addict. She was not an alcoholic. She meets a man. Uh, her husband and she split up. She meets a man a year or so ago. He's an alcoholic. She starts drinking. This woman had never drank before in her life. We had to take her through that. She's just gotten up well butrin and all this kind of stuff. So uh, the, the woman with HIV, and some of the women with HIV, they're far more sophisticated than the women who've kind of spent their lives as um, Criminals, you know, well, I hate that term, but women who've been, been in, in and out of jail. So the difference is on one hand, you have the woman who has spent a lot of time on and off of the revolving door of recidivism with a certain kind of sophistication. And then you have uh, women with HIV, they may come from everywhere. You know, I have women who are, uh, you know, who, who actually have doctorates and that kind of stuff who, who are living with HIV. And so, uh, and they can meet in the middle. I think it's been great. They've been great together. They've been like incredible. Uh, Two communities kind of coming together because we're all women and and uh, I think they really appreciate each other but that's a good question who else has a question yes ma'am um, can you tell us a little bit about how you continue to be or how you continue to grow and be personally challenged in the work mm. it's just some of the best work I ever did I made it up in the shower I really did. I got this call from the California Arts Council, and they wanted me to come in and teach aerobics to incarcerated women. Okay, well, all right, I'm not an aerobics teacher. So I go, like I described earlier, there were all these women there, and I, I had no idea that there were so many women in jail. So immediately, my creative survival techniques kicked in. What can I do? What can I really do to affect their lives? What can I do to make this interesting, too? You know, I'm an artist. I'm a creative force. So, um, and the, the universe opens up and sends you things. I mean, it was like Dr. Mockthinger and his HIV clinic, I got an invitation by way of Kamala Harris, who is now the senator for California, and she said, you should go to this fundraiser. And I'm like, she said, I think you're gonna, I, I think you're gonna be, you're gonna find that it's gonna change your life and you're gonna be of help to the clinic. So I went and I met Dr. Mocktinger, and while I'm there, I meet all these women that I had known early in my career working at the county jail. Now they were like uh, out of jail, but they were all HIV positive. They're, they're basically sober. And then the young woman whose mother was being honored, this woman comes up, she's like 23, 24, and she goes, Miss Jones, you don't remember me? You used to carry me around when you taught dance class. And it was like, and now she's a, a, a full-grown young adult. And so all of this feeds me. It feeds me. Now, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. Like, you know, I'm going to go to the Caribbean 1st of July and just go swim and sleep and do all those other things, you know, <laughs> I'll do those things. And then I'm going to Brazil for a spa uh, later in the summer. And so I, 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 I'm lucky that I know to do this and I can afford to do this because I have to take care of myself. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm cute, but I'm old. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's true. But uh, no, I think that that's what keeps me going is that it's magical, especially when it comes from your heart. It's just coming at you and just be ready. But as I said earlier, do your work. Don't get into, is this working or not? As long as you're making contact with people, that's so important. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Oh, hi. Um, hi. I wanted to ask, in, in your experience in this work, what does it mean for you to heal? And I think healing often takes on a medical connotation. And um, in addition to that question, I wanted to ask, what have your experiences been working with the medical, medical community? What challenges have you faced? And what, yeah, what limitations do you see in that medical approach? Well, Dr. Mocktinger is an angel. He's an angel in America. You know, he really is. I, uh, and he, 
he told me, he said, I challenge you. He said, I challenge you to take the same methodology that you use with your incarcerated women and take my women with HIV and find ways to get them to come out with their stories. And that was our, that was our, our, our relationship began there. And uh, so uh, the medical, uh, the, what Dr. Mockfinger does as far as HIV, which is brilliant, he gets the top of the line whatever they're doing. And these women get it, these uh, African Americans, these Latino women, women who have, he says, if, if, when the man that the, I loved and was involved with died of cancer, and uh, he said, you know, and before he died, he, was, he, he wasn't documented, so he was nervous about coming to the clinic, and Eddie said, tell him to come to my clinic. And then Eddie said, does he have HIV? And I said, well, no, but he says, damn, I wish he did, because I can get him an apartment. I could get, really, you know, this is like, this is what Eddie Mocktinger does as a doctor at UC Medical Center. So that's, that's, that's my take on, he, that's futuristic in a lot of ways, but he knows, like he said in the, in the video, if women, uh, women can't come out about their status. And other side, you can't come out if you don't, you're not comfortable, if you don't have a nice place to live, if you're not, if you're not given the best kind of care that's possible. And that's, that I say that for the, the medical community, knowing this doctor and, and dealing with HIV. Uh, I'm, not really a, I'm not really a patient type person myself. I don't go run into the doctor often, but uh, Eddie is doing wonders for women with HIV. Healing, healing is really, uh, for me, when I look at these women who look so much like me, like my daughter, like my sisters, uh, I'm grateful that I missed that bullet. I was a hippie in, this, in the 60s. You know, I was a wild colored girl, just having a good old time. But my baby, having a baby so young was a godsend. And I had, uh, and my daughter is, is no joke. She's scary. She's still scary. She's 51 and she's still scary. <laughs> but when she was nine, 10 years old, she had no problem with saying, she, mom, mom, where are you going? And I'd say, I'm going to go. She said, well, you promise? And she'd be waiting, that little booger. She'd be like, mommy, you said you were going to be back. And now you ain't even back. And so, so it was like, and we, we developed this bond. And I didn't know. I, I just knew that this, I had this child who depended upon me. But it, I grew. And, it, and I grew to understand that just in taking care of this baby that my father said I would understand by and by. My father said, you'll understand why you have this baby. I had no intentions of having a baby. I was too fat. I was going to go to Russia and be a ballerina. But I had this baby, and my father said, don't give my grandchild away. And if you got to go, you go. But you leave this baby, you leave my blood here with me. And that was healing, to know that I was loved like that. You know, so, um, and also being able to forgive other people. Her father has since died. My daughter's father, he was an asshole. <laughs> I mean, uh, but he was incredibly bright. He was a lawyer. He was a fabulously advanced black man on certain levels. And I thank him. He's dead now, but he, we have this daughter who's brilliant, you know? So uh, healing, and healing happens all the time. It does, there's no point in your life you go, okay, I'm healed now, because it isn't like that. You know, you're always pulling back the skin. The dead, the scab, yeah. Uh, yes? Uh, what do you think in your childhood inspired you to find this I, um, oh, that's an interesting question. I got the job, the California Arts Council called me and asked me to teach aerobics to incarcerated women. And I, I was already a dancer, and uh, so I went. And I just wanted, I, 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 I'm an artist, I'm a creative source. So I thought, what can I really do here? Because they didn't want to do aerobics. <laughs> you know, they did not want to do it. So that started it. But I, I'm a migrant child, you know, uh, moving from one place to the next. Uh, my mother and father are, they're, they are incredibly gracious and beautiful and smart. And, but they're not educated people. They just see the world. They're political in that sense. And we, that was how we lived. It was like, there were no strangers for my father. And if somebody was hungry or needed something, we helped. You know, but don't get stupid. Because my father would brain, brain you with a two by four. But basically, you know, they were good people. And I think that was what set me on this track. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep missing you, madam. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, can you talk about um, what you think of representation of incarcerated women in the media? Mm -hmm. like, I'm thinking of artists in black. What is your...
what is your take on that show? Orange is the new black. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I wish I'd thought of it, but uh, for the, but I, uh, my experience is just very different. You know, um, they've glamorized it a lot. It's sanitized, and they have to sell it. Um, uh, I, I don't watch it much. I watched the first season, and uh, because I tried to get HBO years ago to buy my tapes, I wanted them to show America Undercover. I want to show, I want them to show my work on HBO, and out of it comes the new, oh, the new, the new orange, the the new black, and then it was another show about women, incarcerated women, that happened. Uh, so they took my idea and ran with Oz happened, and uh, Susan Sarandon came and raised a, did a benefit for me, and even Susan. Uh, Dead Man Walking, I think that she she did that. That that came out of the work, and I I'm not I, I you know I'm not bitter. I mean I'm in the, I'm in the game, you know. But it's like uh, I don't have a lot of opinions about about that. Other than that, women in lockdown, they're our sisters, they're our cousins, they're our lovers, you know. They they are part of this this chain of human be human beings. That's what I've learned. I love women, and the crazier they are in jail, they are, there's some crazy. Now, I don't know about the orange, that orange is black and all that, but there's some crazy women in jail. But, you know, I stand back and I go, that's the bitch I want at my back if I'm in jail. Because they, the loyalty, they are wild. As, as we were promised that we were wild. You know, they're satyrs. They're, they are nymphs. They are, they will, you know, they, they're, they're brazen and free you know, on a certain level now, they can hurt themselves. So you have to like bring it down, but I'm so charmed that I, I've met them. I met them at their fury. I'll tell you a story. A young woman, um, a young white, white woman, I was working with a lot of old elderly black women. This is like my third or fourth year in the jails. And I was a young white girl, a stud mother. She was so cute. She was back in jail. She had done something she had gotten. She was back in jail. And so I'm talking about betrayal and trust. And she says, she tells us this story about the girlfriend who she gave her money to when she did time. She did time, came back, the girlfriend had spent the money, and the girlfriend said, well, look, there's a deal going down. They want you, they want you in on it, right? So it's a boy that liked her in high school. It's a boy that uh, always resented that this girl was very out about being a lesbian. But she, see, she says, okay, I'll go, I'll meet these men. There was three of them. She goes to this house that's being renovated in the hate in San Francisco. No girlfriend. The girlfriend is not around. There are the three men upstairs with the dope in the bag, with the money peeking out of the bag, and they're sitting there like wolves. And she's like, oh, what now? And the guy goes, let's play strip poker. And she says, I'm in it. She's thinking this, right? And she's telling us. And we're, you know, I love black women too, because honey, we in it. Yeah, girl, come on, come on, come on. Everybody's in it. And they're listening. And she says, and she's thinking, I'm going to keep my boots on. I'm going to try to keep my pant, my underwear on. And I might, I might have to lose my jacket and my pants. But I'm, a, but I'm gonna, she's, she's thinking, I'm getting out of here. I'm gonna save my own life. So she says, she's down to just her little panties and she's got her fry boots, whatever. And there is the dope on the table and the money and the goddess is good because it's all like in a bag. She says she knew the moment. She, she knew the moment, she grabbed it. And she said, I hauled ass. And these men are like, oh, they're shocked. And she has, has a gun in the bag, the weight of the bag. She is running for her life. She says she jumped over the banister. These men are like calling her all kinds of names. So she's caught them. They're all half-dressed too because it was going to be a party. She is hauling butt. She says she jumps down. A man shoots her in the hip, one of the guys. She says, I got hit in the hip. But something says, roll, keep going, keep going. These men are coming, coming down the stairs. She's limping, but she has this bag with money and drugs. <laughs> And then there's a woman. She runs out in the street, and it's an elderly woman. Stops, almost hits her. She says, those men are trying to kill me. Those men, the ladies just said, let's get the hell out of here. And they, they, she says, take me to Daly City to my father's house. Her father didn't live in Daly City. This woman just took her as far from the center of San Francisco 
as possible. And by now, this young lady is saying, and I, and I, and I, and I got, I got, and I see in her eyes, she's falling. I'm like, she's falling. She's like, and I got, and I got, and I asked, say to the women, I said, let's grab her. And all these women, they lift, I said, lift her up, y'all, lift her up. She's still trying to tell us. I said, you, you're okay? She said, no, I got a, I got, I got a way. And we're walking around and she can't breathe. They stand her up again, and I just grab her face, and I said, baby girl, you live to tell the story. You live to tell the story. And, and, the, the, and I see her once in a while. Now, she's okay. She's doing her thing, and she's got a woman that loves her and all this. I see her around the city. But it's like the power and the, br the bravery was amazing. It was just amazing. And this is what I get. This is what I get for staying in the game, that, that, it's, it, that it's not fairy tales, that when we go for it, go for it. Yeah, so I hope that, I hope that answered it. Who else? Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> What's well, so all the the uh, the students who will 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 feed me? They will inform me too. They'll inform me as to where we're going, what we're doing. I may name a process, a class, and when they show up, we. I, I believe in the. I mean, I believe in talking. I believe in communicating. I believe in them. I believe in finding out from them as much as I can about why are you here, especially in artist social change. I mean, it's like this whole area of study, which is real. But for the young ones, it's like, well, why, what is it that you want? What is it that you think this is? Have you, our, our children now, they can touch, they have this thing in their hand. They can like, they can hit a button and they know everything about me. And that impresses me as to if you've done your homework. So it'll, it, will, it, it will shift and change when I get amongst the community. Yeah, yeah, that's what, it, that's, that's how I will approach it. And uh, I have this great house out there, yeah. <laughs> So if nothing's nothing's kicking in town, I'll be out there, okay? <laughs> okay, how are we doing? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, is this helping? I mean, the people feeding thing, you, you feeling this? Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned that part of your goal is like, or part of your ethos maybe is art is social change, mm -hmm. but it also seems like a large part of your work is therapeutic for the women that you work with. And I was wondering if those two things are ever in tension or in conflict and how you navigate that. I heard last night Naomi Nye was talking and she had said that Grace Paley had said that uh, politics was simply being able to look out, being political was seen, it was about looking out and seeing the world as a whole thing. So I think it's much more my politics as a, and Alice Walker says that we're all, we may not, we may not all be feminists, but we're all womanist. We all bleed, if nothing else, you know. Um, so I don't think about it as therapy as much as theater saved my life. Theater saved my life. So that's what I brought into the center with, with anybody that I work with. And it's like, it's so in, in the class today, in, in uh, Vi's class and uh, 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 Patty's, she, talking to these young people, but don't worry about the audience so much. Do the work, be involved. And that's always been the case for me. You know, it's like uh, theater is so amazing. You know, it's, a, it's, such a, it's such a magical place to find yourself in no matter what the population is. And so, but you gotta give to it. And it's the only lover that will never let you down. It's the only lover, that, if that lover will be there, you'll be landing with your award saying, wow, I did that. And theater would be saying, you sure did, Ro, you did the damn thing, you know? <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, it's about giving, giving, trusting, doing, being, you know, and caring. Yes, ma'am. that makes it particularly suited to the work that you do? You mentioned finding <laughs> these, yourself. These, you know, y'all, these questions, I'm going home now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is it about art? Would you say now, say it again? That makes it so suited to the work you do? Um. Well, it's a mixture of make-believe, and at the same time, because culturally, socially, the population is such that they need to believe in something else. 
They like it phantasmagoric. I, I worked with, when I first started, that was the addict, crack cocaine was an amazing addiction. And because of that, people were like, you know, crack addicts are up all night. They're spinning out of control. A friend of mine who was married to a heroin addict, she said, give me a heroin addict anytime. A crack addict is up all night long. And uh, the phantasmagoric possibilities with theater. And uh, I used to play Marvin Gaye's What's Going On all the time. And I'd get the women to just walk around and move and change directions. And people would cry, you know. And then I'd also have uh, um, Make My Funk, the P-Funk. What's that group? I want to get funked up. I want the bomb. And then that's a whole nother, like, hey, huh. And this is jail. And, they, and, and everybody's, Louise Nevelson, the, the sculptress, says, move. It doesn't matter the medium, move. So I would go in the jails, I just put the sounds on and watch what they do, you know. Or you watch people that don't really relate to each other, all of a sudden they're dancing with each other. You know, it's like, uh, and the jailers are happy. Everybody's kind of happy, you know. They don't want people to get too familiar, but they're happy, you know. And that, that's where I begin, you know. Uh, and it's an artful place. Uh, have you ever seen this poster that says, how to be an artist? Have you ever seen that one? And it's about, um, you know, um, make mud pies with children, eat a cake with your hands, uh, entertain, uh, invite a dangerous person to lunch. It's like all these things around becoming an artist. And I feel like, and, and they're very raw and basic. This is not something you're gonna learn in art school. But it's like what, I've, what my life has brought to me, so uh, it's all artful. Raising your children, you have children? You, are you gonna have some? Maybe if you do, your child. Children are delightful little art objects and they love it, you, but you gotta be an art object too. They gotta be able to paint your face and all that too, yeah, yeah. How we doing? Okay, yes ma'am. I'm, I'm curious about the storytelling. Um, only that, that when you tell your story, you attach meaning to certain parts or emphasis. And I'm wondering, since so many of these women probably had overlapping um, events or themes, how hearing each other's stories helped them reinterpret their own and, and attach meaning in different ways and what that process was like? Well, I started with the Greek classics because we lived in upstate New York, and, and people were always giving my father boxes of books that always had Greek classics, Roman classics. So we would read this stuff in Little, ha Little, Little House on the Prairie, uh, all, all of these other books to Tom Sawyer. But, but we read. We were very literary. But the classics were like, as I got older, it was the universal story is one. And then I realized that in jails, and I, was, I will close out with the questions that I asked the women, is that uh, one, they're all mythical creatures. Now as a teacher, I've got to be clever enough to move that into the conversation. That like the story of the girl that survived and flew away with the money, you know, finding a Greek myth, a Roman myth to, to attach to that if I was going to use it in a performance. But, uh, a lot of what I found about incarcerated women, especially now they're much younger than they used to be, they love stories. We all love stories. You know, and, and, and I always start out telling, uh, I bring in actresses from the community and their job is to tell or read the story. You know, and then as we get to know each other, their stories become as important. You know, and everybody's listening. And they're doing something other than plotting to get, to get high or to, or to beat up somebody in the shower or, because all that's still going on too. But and then we're looking at each other. I'm looking at you. And we both had mothers, you know what I'm saying? And maybe your mom, I, again, I was in Maryland. I was at, uh, I was doing Big Butt Girls, Hard Headed Women, which was my one woman show. And I met this, uh, this just uh, jail no, 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 I'm at this uh, community center where this judge has ordered these women through the court to come and do workshops with me and uh, the doctors from the hospital nearby, they have come and this beautiful doctor, I mean this doctor with blue eyes, and he's just like, he had no idea. He's a, he wants to be a better person, but he's totally wealthy. He starts telling his story about his father getting up on Sunday and making them pancakes and then sailing 
sailing in there. And these, and these women are like, your daddy used to make you pancakes. Your daddy used to take you sailing. You look like your daddy. Ooh, you was lucky to have you. Did you love your daddy? Did your daddy love you? And he's looking at me like, Wait, isn't this? And I'm like, come on, <laughs> you know, talk to them. Talk to them. And the girl said, I bet you drive a BMW, the little hard ass. She's like, I bet you drive a BMW. And he's looking at me like, do I have to answer that? And I'm like, yeah, talk to them. They told you the craziest stuff about them. And by the end, they wrapped their arms around him. And he was not, he didn't come in, he was going to come in to do good. He was going to help those people. And those women, I had them lift him up. They walked around the room with him high above there. And he was like, he said, thank you. He said, thank you. I had no idea that my day would end like this. So I hope that answers your question. Yes. I'm sort of wondering about how you see political and public narratives intersecting and interacting with personal narratives you experience. They always do. <laughs> they, they always do. Um, there's no way around it. We just got to be willing to listen. And there are times when I have a friend, Carol, beautiful woman, crazy white girl. She make lot, she's brilliant at making money. Not so good with men. <laughs> Went to Standing Rock, met this fabulous Native American man who she was drawn to because he was so intense and he was so angry. So they kind of got together and they got more intimate and he wanted to talk about white people. And what had happened at Standing Rock is she was like, it's okay if he wants it, but I need room to tell him that I'm not like that. And I'm like, Carolyn, shut up. Listen, he's with you. You know that you're not like that. But you got to let him open his heart and give a review. If you're just going to be his friend and put all that other stuff in your back pocket. You know, she, he knows you're, you're, you're there in Standing Rock with them, with the people. He knows this. But I just feel like I hear this stuff about Black Lives Matter. And I said, yeah, it does. I said, please don't say all lives matter. We know that. Well, I'm not going to say that, but see, now you're getting mad at me. I said, no, I'm not getting mad at you, baby, but you're my girl. If we're going to move forward down this line, this road, we got to be real, real, real with each other. You know, it's like, and not be offended. Because that's how we're going to take back our country. That's how we're going to, like, change the world. That's how we're going to change the laws. That's how we're going to stop the killings, you know, because we stand together for real. And nobody's offended when, oh, white people, yeah. White people, white people like God got a lot to answer for. You know, when people say about God, I say, God's got a lot of explaining to do. And white people do too. <laughs> you know, it's like, uh, yeah, but any other questions? Uh, I love y'all. Let's be here all night, damn it. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. When you were first one of the first voices about the woman who was incarcerated, what was that experience like? Yeah. Was it Bianca Robinson, yes. Prostitution, really? Oh, yeah. Angry that these women are put away from things. Like really oh, I do. I get angry. You that anger. I did. I, 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 we run, we jump, we roll. I mean, yeah. Kind of I mean, with them? No, with, I mean, for myself. For myself, you mean? For how I'm just that. Well, you know, what I do in the jail. I used to do, I'm not, I don't do as much. I take a body, somebody who's open, somebody who can admit she's a prostitute. You gotta get rid of the shame and the stigma around it because the oldest profession was begging. And the second profession was having something to trade. And women get all, well, I'm, yeah, I, 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 I turned a few tricks. You did that. Now, are you gonna keep doing it? Because if you're gonna keep doing it, let's get your body together. They love that. I'll say, you know, you can't sell chicken if it looks like jello. And I mean, it's something as simple as meeting them where they are is what I can do for my heart and my head, you know, because my job really isn't to tell them not to do it. You know, until the, con until the country opens, till there are more opportunities that will be pro prostitutes. And there's some high rolling prostitutes, 
you know, who make a lot of money, but again, it's race and culture, you know? And, but I don't, I don't wanna wish that some women are too bright for prostitution. But if they're doing it, it's, uh, I just wanna be there and be as the best support that I can in any way that I can. And I do, I pray a lot, and I, I meditate a lot for myself. And learn how to forgive people, you know? It's like, and stay away from the crazies, you know? And I don't own a gun, which I'm glad, because somebody would be in trouble. But I hope that answers your question. Uh, one more, who, who had one more? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, so kind of the, the title of this kind of collaboration that a lot of us mm. the, in this class is Radical Unwearning. So we talk about, you know, what it means to, to unwearn or to be unearthed. And I was just, I'm curious to hear in, in your work how you, how you embody that or how you you know, question yourself, question the work, um, and just have that critical presence in the work that you do. Well, to dovetail on her talking about prostitution, I had to learn to meet people where they were. It wasn't my, it wasn't my job, or it wasn't even my, I didn't even care to talk about a lady shouldn't be a prostitute. And it was like, but I'm talking to my family, they're like, ooh, ooh, because I have Pentecostal people and everything in my family. And this whole thing of like, you, bro, you, you mean, you sat there and let her, sit, what, let her said it? She was talking about her life. It was her story, you know, and also having to learn to hear it. And back to talking with this lady about race, you know, it's like un unlearned as a black person, I'm gonna tip around and be nice and I'm gonna be nice and polite. Because that's how I've survived in this culture, you know. And at the same time, it's time now for us just to talk about race and, and unlearn the anger and the anxiety about it and just talk about it. So does that make sense? So that's, the, from where I am, that's what I can do, you know. And I love people. I mean, I really do. I love, I love people. I love all of us, even the... Old Agent Orange, you know, I mean, I don't wish him any real harm. I mean, just wish, I wish he'd disappear, but, you know. <laughs> but uh, the, is that the last question? Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Uh, um, am I doing this from Diane? Or, or? This is the second video. Okay. Okay. Is the, the, this is the most, uh, um, uh, two years ago, we, we, we actually uh, um, partnered with Planned Parenthood, and uh, this is uh, Birthright, which is with uh, incarcerated women, which I was challenged. Uh, people were worried about, did, did incarcerated women have any connection to, to birth control, to Planned Parenthood? Duh. And th these are their stories, okay? Who am I? What am I? Who and what have I become? Homeless, strung out, pregnant, stripper. Addicted to meth. Heart sick with the needle. I broke my own heart standing on the corner selling my precious body. Broken, breaking, Heart. I never thought I could break my own heart, but I have, over and over again. I never thought I would be doing anything like this. Never entered my mind that I would be doing anything like this. I broke my own heart when I let a man do things to me that I really didn't want him to do. It was like I was in a nightclub, like, and I was just, like I was singing the blues, telling the story. But you see, I was on drugs, and he was supplying. I got pregnant, had an abortion, and he od Who are these women? And what? What are they to you? To you? To you? Women are fabulous creatures. We're scary. We're we're much scarier than men. I mean, <laughs> we really are. You know, and you just don't. And then the the power. How do we put women in touch with their power? She's our mama. She's your lover. That woman's a woman who's going to carry your child. There's a liberation that comes with finding your voice. They can come out about who they really are 
what their fears are, what their angers are, they, what they have suffered, the journey that they've taken. Before I could scream and before I could shout, he laid me out, covered my mouth and whispered, shut up, bitch. I cried. I kept it all to myself. I was raped 11 days before my 10th birthday. That was something that was imposed on me, it had nothing to do with me. So you grow up thinking that something's wrong with you or that you've, you brought this on yourself or, you know, especially when you keep everything to yourself. I didn't talk to anyone about it. My rape was a crime so unspeakable, so shameful, that I couldn't even talk about it up until three years ago. We all are recovering for something. And to put our truth out there is, is very awesome. I am healing the memories of being raped. I know I've done nothing wrong. Once I do my piece, I feel so relieved. I'm healing myself from the inside. I got a call from my doctor. She said, your HIV test is positive. Some people, they get kind of like, they get nervous about the truth. But you know what? This old heart of mine, yeah. I will put it back together. Right. One piece at a time. Yeah. We talk about our struggles and we talk about things that happened to us. That way you just lift it off my shoulder and it's just like, ah. Oh. I'm kind of like free. Planned Parenthood? Planned Parenthood? Did anybody mention anything about a Planned Parenthood? <gasps> Honey, I love me some Planned Parenthood. I was incarcerated in the San Bruno County Jail, and Rodessa came out into the jail and they were doing a play, and I knew a lot of girls in the jail, so I was like, I didn't want to stay in a dorm, so I would go out and see what this was about. And I went out, and I've been there ever since. It's been 24 years. You know how we all like that alcohol and have to get to the liquor store by 2 o'clock? Yeah. Well, back in the day, me and my girl, hey. we had to be at Planned Parenthood by 4.30 to get them condoms. The dress rehearsal. I was standing back there, I got really, really emotional. You know, it's just something just magical about uh, on my way to walking out on the stage. I just love it. You know what I'm talking about, the <laughs> What I learned from my abortion. I haven't been incarcerated and I'm not HIV positive. And so I was, you know, wondering like, do I, will I have anything to contribute? I learned that actually, Almost every single woman I know has had an abortion. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. true. That this procedure, the one that no one talks about, everyone has had. Everyone's story is important. And everyone goes through issues around being a woman and choice in their bodies, um, you know, no matter what their background is. Yeah. He was my first boyfriend. I made him wait three years, and then I finally gave it up. We had sex and he stopped calling. I was devastated. And six weeks later, I was throwing up everything I ate and my period was late. So I went to Planned Parenthood alone to take a pregnancy test. And it came back positive. So I opted to have a medical abortion. We don't just have abortions and go home and like, woo, that's off my back. I'm dealing with this still and this was three years ago. That night, I tried to kill myself. Overdosing on my mother's sleeping pill, I woke up in the hospital. I never knew how precious life was until I tried to take my own. It was hard for me to have, have an abortion, and I felt so sad and depressed afterwards, but not because I thought that I'd made a mistake, and not because of my, I had issues around morality, but because hormones <laughs> suddenly dropped. If I'm pregnant and I decide to have an abortion because I feel like I can't take care of my baby or my, the baby's father won't be around or whatever the reason is, I feel like that's my choice. That's nobody else's business. Our bodies have been used and abused by, other, by people other than ourselves. Because a lot of women don't have a voice and we need that. 
We need all women to come together to have that voice and let the congressman, whoever, this is our body. We should be able to make our own choices. Kathy, all women love babies. Felicia, all women love babies. Deborah, all, all are different. We, all of us women are come from different backgrounds and different places, but we all come together and we do this wonderful thing. To have that sisterhood, you know, that's pretty unique um, and it's worth a lot. We don't know how it's going to come together until the last week of it, but it always does and it's always beautiful and it's always powerful. Medea is my life and it keeps me grounded. And I'm, when, I, when I'm not there, if I'm not there for like a month or two, I miss it so much and, and it's, my, my soul yearns for it. You know, it's, it's, it does some, it completes me. Art, art could be that parachute, that beautiful thing that can catch us all. I really believe that. All women love me. Okay, we're going to wind it down now. We're about ready to wind it down. Yeah. I could use a drink, but no. <laughs> I want to close with two pieces. One piece is um, written by Nancy Johnson, who was in my company for about eight years. The Rockefeller Foundation gave us a grant to explore our race and culture in ca captivity. And Nancy wrote this piece for that show. And this piece is entitled, Nigga. Everyone wants to be one, but nobody wants to be one. That should be a criteria for being a nigga. A nigga meaning down, meaning mac, and meaning pack, and meaning hard, meaning you my nigga. What up, nigga? Nigga, please. First, to be a nigga, you have to have been a nigger at some point meaning being treated like a nigger, meaning last hired, first fired nigger, meaning 911 ain't sending nobody nigger, meaning last welcome, first followed nigger, meaning le driving on the influence of Africa nigger, meaning living the blues whether you can sing them or not nigger, meaning death row nigger. You can't just put on some baggy pants and carve a swish in your head and call yourself a nigger. A nigger got a nigger's game and a nigger's pain rolled up in a word we should all be tired of by now, but we're not. And now a nigger's the thing to be whether you've been a nigger or not. So those of us who are in danger of niggerly treatment from corn belt wannabe niggas, meaning people who package an insult and sell it back to us, yeah, them. Those of us who have been niggers for real, meaning against our own definition, may as well take power over the word since it won't go away. Meaning taking power over the, our image, meaning setting our own standards of niggerdom. Meaning if we're the niggers, then we should reap all the benefits of nigger eshness, meaning cash. Meaning money takes the girl out of nigger. And you can call yourself a nigger if you must, but you need to pay props to us ex-cotton picking niggers for the honor. You need nigger certification. And of course, nobody's tired of this word yet. We too busy making it all nigger good, like if everyone's a nigger, then no one will notice that we're the niggers in this wood pile and being treated as such. Meaning, ain't that some nigger shit nigger? And when the play niggers get tired or older or have kids or buy a house, what reason will they give for not wanting to live anywhere near no real authentic niggerfied niggerish niggers or niggas? They will grow up and on to another fashion craze. And once that happens, a nigger will be what a nigger has always been, meaning a nigger nigger.
That's Nancy Johnson. Thank you. And I'm going to close with the questions. Someone asked me about the questions. These are the basic questions. It's called the hidden, the hidden talent questionnaire. And it all, this is where we begin our writings from. This is uh, for women in particular, but I use it with men and boys too. But it's called the hidden talents questionnaire. And one age. No, I'm sorry. One is name. Two is age. Three, hidden talents. Four, do you write? Five, would you like to write? Six, home, last address. Seven, when were you last at home? Eight, when did you leave home? Nine, why did you leave home? Ten, who did you leave at home? Eleven, this is very important for girls, who did you leave home with? Because people think girls run away with little boys, they don't, you know. They either run away with grown as men or women when they run away from home. 12, please describe fantasy home. 13, what is a parent? 14, who are your parents? 15, what is, a, what is parenting? 16, what was the last bit of advice you remember from a parent? 17, are you a parent? 18, if you could do anything or be anywhere, where would you go? Name the place. 19, love. What is love? 20, who do you love? 21, very important for all of us, who loves you? 22, if love had a face, name it. 23, describe the last time you saw love. 24, death slash birth. How have you escaped death? 24, what is rebirth? 26, if you could turn back time, how would you change your life? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you.